I wanted to at least discuss this problem because uh, it is complicated. And uh, it's worth looking at. So we've got, and we mentioned this somewhat last time. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, I'll look at this example, uh, maybe some other example problem related to tetherball and also Indiana Jones. Uh, and then we'll talk about some theory on conservation of angular momentum, central forces, and multi-particle systems. I mean, what, what we're sort of doing is that we're first talked about one particle systems, then we'll talk about multi-particle systems, then we'll make a constraint on multi-particle systems where they're all rigidly connected. And uh, we call this a, a rigid body of particles. And it's sort of a stepping stone to looking at actual rigid bodies. Um, and then we'll talk about, I think we'll talk about rigid bodies. Uh, we may first talk about Lagrange's equations for dealing with multi-particle systems. But that's you know looking down the line. Over the next couple of weeks, um, it'll be kind of multi-particle systems and some facts about them and some examples. Okay. So for this problem, this is you're asked for the the acceleration of p. I I believe. So that means your goal is the inertial acceleration vector p with respect to uh, some origin, inertial origin there, we'll use that. So the inertial acceleration of P is what? Well, we have to set this up. So the way that we set it up is we notice this point P is attached to the disc. The disc is rotating. Um, and last time I said, you should introduce a frame that's attached to the disc, this like an S frame. So let's call this SR, and then we would have uh, S th uh, theta, that's an S theta. And um, then we would have three frames total. So we introduce the S frame attached to the disc. And all that we really need is the, the unit vectors. So the unit vectors are SR, which is pointing from this middle of the disk to P, S theta, which increases in the direction theta is increasing, that variable theta. And then S3 completes our right-handed coordinate system. And to complete our right-handed coordinate system, let's do SR, do, use the right-hand rule and do the cross product, SR cross, S theta, my thumb will be pointing in the direction of kind of along this bar. Oops, I erased things. I did not want to erase things. It's pointing along this bar, S3. It's in the negative ER direction. So S3 is exactly negative ER. And then of course, we've got the I frame is inertial. It's not moving. And then we've got the frame attached to the bar or rod. And now um, to eventually get the inertial acceleration, we'd first have to get the inertial velocity and we'll have to use the transport equation because if we write down what is our uh, R, the location of P with respect to O, that is, let's call this point here Q, sort of an intermediary point. So it's the location of Q with respect to O plus the location of P with respect to Q. Um, the vector from uh, o to Q, this is just capital R in the ER direction. 
and from Q to P, that's just little r in this SR direction that we've introduced that's attached to the disk. And if we if we wanted to write this completely in, in the S frame, we could. We would call this R uh, negative S3 plus R S R. Oops, got something wrong there. And then we would take an, an inertial derivative to get the inertial velocity. And we would use the transport equation. So we would uh, say, well, what is the time derivative with respect to the S frame plus, and now it's the tricky part, what's the angular velocity vector of the S frame with respect to the I frame? Because that's this key part of the transport equation. <laughs> so we can, we can reason this out. We know that the um, we know the angular velocity addition formula. So the angular velocity addition formula says angular velocity of the S frame with respect to the I frame is the angular velocity of the um, E frame with respect to the I frame plus the angular velocity of the S frame with respect to the E frame. Okay, so then what are these two terms on the right-hand side there? The angular velocity of the E-frame with respect to the I-frame. Well, so that's how this horizontal rod, the horizontal rod is rotating. And the rotation is just, it's an increase in phi. And the rotation axis is this N3 direction or E3 direction, whichever you want to call it. So the rate is phi dot and the axis, the, dire the direction we use the right hand rule, our fingers curl in the direction phi is increasing and my thumb is pointing in the N3 direction. So we can call this N3 or if you want E3 because they're the same direction. This is also E3. All right. Um, and then what about the angular velocity of the S frame with respect to the E frame? Well, how is that rotating? Um, this disc, if the disc is rotating, the angular rate's going to be, because we only have this angle theta, think of Right hand rule, my fingers curl in the direction that theta is increasing. My thumb is pointing in the S3 direction. So that means that's the axis of rotation. And we could also write this as um, S3 is negative ER. Okay, so then this angular velocity over here, we could write um, phi dot, E3 minus theta dot ER. And we have, we basically have enough to do the transport equation and figure things out. So we have everything we need. If you need to, you know, uh, put things into the same frame, hopefully you can figure out what are some of the, you know, what are the E frame directions compared to the S frame directions? You do that two by two matrix to relate, say E3 and E phi with SR and S theta, et cetera. So you can go from there. If you haven't, if you haven't tried that, you should try that problem. Okay, and I th think that's the one that has the, the solution uh, written at the bottom of, of the problem. So try that, okay. Oh, and don't make the mistake that thinking that this, there's some kind of constraint, like this is a wheel rolling on, on the ground. So it's not, it's a disc that's rotating on its own. If it was a, a disc that's rotating on, on the ground, there's gonna be some relationship 
between theta dot and phi dot, but that's that's not the situation we're looking at. Okay, we might look at that later. That's sort of like a grinding disk uh, used for grinding uh, grains in ancient times. All right. So I wanted to go through a an interesting little problem. Um, it's mentioned in in the book, and I guess the best way to refer to it is as a tether ball. So this is it's a well. Let's just show some pictures of tether ball, and then maybe something else. I don't know if you played tether ball, or if you know what I'm talking about. Um, tether ball. These are kids playing tether ball. So there's a ball attached to the top of the pole. And then I think the goal, I didn't really play much of this when I was a kid, but you, you hit the ball and I think you want it to wrap around. Right? And so as it wraps around, just think of the, in the two dimensional plane of the ball, imagine we hit it so hard, there's no real three dimensionality. It's just wrapping around and eventually it's going to, just given one hit, it'll wrap around and eventually the ball will hit the pole. And if you're the one, I think, to make it hit the pole, you win or something. And the goal is for the other person to hit it the other way. So it's um, it'll be accelerating as well, right? Because if we're just in the plane of the the wrapping of the string around the pole, you can neglect gravity. It's basically just an inertial inertial forces are dictating what's what's going on. There's some other related stuff. Um, that just sort of comes from my own research and interest. We've looked at, this is some footage of a snake, a flying snake landing in a tree, and you see it kind of wraps around stuff. This was some earlier work by uh, Dr. Jake Soha. I think we've got some, got some others. So this is, I don't know what this is. Okay, this is a snake landing on, on a pole. Yeah, you've got to see some context for this. So we had some high-speed cameras set up looking at a snake landing on a pole. So here's the snake, because they jump on trees like from branch to branch and their, their bodies will wrap around the pole. And at some point we had the question, how much of this is just passive? It'd be like a whip attaching to a pole, kind of like Indiana Jones. He throws the whip so that he can swing across a, a chasm. Um, and I think this is just showing in detail the actual landing. Let's back up, back up, back up. So this is showing once the, we had another camera looking down the pole. And so this is showing every few milliseconds what the uh, snakes, this is the end, end of the tail. And it really does accelerate, I think, and then That's kind of cool. Um, this is a clip from Mythbusters. I don't even know if you can hear it. But they, yeah, so Indiana Jones swinging across a chasm on his whip. Swing across a chasm with a whip. Like he throws the whip and it wraps around and then he uses that. It's strong enough to help him swing across a chasm. And I think they were testing to see if they could actually do that. Uh, I don't know if they do. We're not going to. We're not exploring that. But so that's the setup for the problem. Um, well, that's the motivation, I guess. So in its, like if we were to really look at the whip or the snake, we would say we've got, um, we've got some cylinder. Um, and then we've got some say solid rod or rope and then the rope is going to be kind of wrapping around and as it wraps around it'll be shrinking and shrinking and shrinking but we're looking at the simpler problem of we've got a massless rope with a mass at the end so that's tether ball so yes you could apply this to flying snake landing i put flying snake there's a bunch of snakes that live in trees so maybe it's more general to say uh, uh tree snakes scares me. I, I don't want snakes living in trees. I think around here they don't. I've seen a few 
you know, the big black snakes that I think eat mice or something. I've seen those and they scare me, but I don't think they're harmful. One was like chasing my son when he was only three years old along a, a river bank. And I'm like, oh, this is the scariest thing. But um, we outran the snake. So that's good. So this is, this is example 4.7. The, the tetherball example is example 4.7 in the Kasdan and uh, Paley book. So let's, let's sort of give a diagram of the situation. We've got, it's a cross section through the pole. So here is cross section through the pole. The, so let's call the middle of the pole um, O and the local point of attachment of the string. So as it's wrapping around, there's this point that we'll call O prime. And here's point P. I guess the, this thing needs to be tangent. So there we go. There's the mass. That's the tether ball, point P. And then we've got this certain length of rope um, that's left. This is, we'll call that L, little L. And little L is shrinking because this thing is gonna be moving around. So we're making the assumption we've hit the ball, the ball is wrapping around. As it wraps around this contact point, O will be moving around the circle and P will be moving around, L will be shrinking and we wanna know what's the dynamics we could write this dynamics in terms of um, certain variables, but let's let's first introduce our our frame. Um, so this is the let me first say it. here's the pole, and it has a radius capital R. Pole of radius R. All right, and then we'll have an inertial frame. Uh, I'll use what the book calls it. It calls this EY and this is EX. Simple enough. But then we can introduce a frame. And this is what's weird. It's not like it's a frame attached to a body. It's a frame attached to this contact point O, but we can still consider it. So attached to this contact point O, we'll call this ER. It's basically a, a, a polar coordinate frame. And um, then we've got E theta because we've got um, a theta. We'll say theta is the angle that the string makes with the EX direction. And so E theta is going to be changing. It'll be, it'll be increasing as the ball is hit and moves around. So, Let's see, is this enough to do what we, what we want? So let's write this vector of the location, R, P, O, the location of the point P, that's the mass of the ball with respect to, uh, oh, I wrote O prime, O prime. What we really want, we need to get R, P, O. Okay, so R, P, O prime, that's just L E R. That's simple enough. What about R P O? That's going to be the location of O with the, O O prime with respect to O plus R P O prime. What is this? This location here. So this little vector. Let me just call it out here. R O prime O is, so it's the location of O prime with respect to O. So it's going to be R, capital R, it's just the radius of the pole and in the negative E theta direction. So over here, we could write negative R E theta plus L E R. Uh, R is a constant, uh, L changes with time. It sort of plays the role of the polar coordinate R, that, 
Um, so what is it? Okay. I don't know what is L as a function of time. Um, maybe it's actually easier to know what is theta as a function of time. But we want to figure that out. Okay. So let's let's say that at the initial time, which we'll say is t equals zero, zero seconds, then theta at t equals zero is zero. And the rope length is some constant capital L. That's just the length of the rope. So the initial situation would be, here's our pole, here is the ball. This is a, this is fade equals zero because it's definitely along the, the EX direction. And this is capital L. Okay. So hopefully you can convince yourself that as this thing starts to wrap around, as it starts to wrap around, um, the amount of string that it wraps around is going to be theta written in radians times um, r. So after some time, the got theta greater than zero and the amount of rope wrapped around the pole is r times theta. And this is where, in general, in this class, you need to write theta in radians because radians are the physical measure. So you need to use radians. If you use angles, you'll, you'll get this totally wrong. So use radians, all right? So this means like after we started going this way, but now it's that contact point has moved over here. There's an amount which is equal to, this is R theta of rope, which means what's left, L. Well, L plus R theta must equal the original length of rope. So there's a relationship between L and theta, and it is L equals little l equals capital L minus R theta. So that's a key relationship. So we can use um, this substituted into here to get what is R P O as a, a function of something that changes in time. We've got negative R E theta plus L minus R theta E R. Okay, and now we can start taking the uh, inertial derivative of, of this. We'll probably have to use the transport equation. So we need a relationship between how this polar coordinate frame, let me just call that the blue frame. Um, if we want a reminder of what that is. So here's E R E theta, and let's just say there's something coming out of the screen, E3, this is the B frame, and we're just superimposing the two frames. So making it look like they have a common uh, origin. Okay, the angle between these two is theta, and what is the angular velocity? The angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the I frame is, um, well, I'll use the right hand rule. We know what the axis is. The axis is the only direction coming out of the screen, E3, that kind of third dimension. So as theta increases, theta, my thumb is pointing in the E3 direction. So this is theta dot, 
the rate of change of theta, that's the rate, and then the direction is E3. And this isn't going to be constant. This may be changing with time, especially as this wraps faster and faster as the portion of the string that's not wrapped gets shorter. All right, so I think we have all the ingredients we need to do the uh, transport equation. So we've got the inertial velocity of the point P. It's just inertial velocity of this position vector that we've written. Um, and what do we have? We can pull out this constant uh, negative R and then it's the inertial derivative of E theta. We'll have to use the transport equation for that. Plus time derivative of L minus R theta. Multiplied by ER plus L minus R theta, inertial derivative of ER. So for this term and this term, we'll have to use the transport equation. And hopefully it's clear that this is going to be angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the I frame cross E theta. Over here, this is angular velocity of B frame with respect to the I frame cross ER. So this is, uh, this is going to be theta dot E3 cross E theta. We have to go back to our diagram over here in the middle of the left. So what is E3 cross E theta using the right hand rule? It's my thumb's pointing in the negative ER direction. So this is negative ER. Over here, we've got theta dot E3 cross ER. What is E3 cross ER? My thumb is pointing in the E theta direction. Uh, what about this thing? Well, the only thing that can change in time is theta. So this just becomes um, negative R theta dot. Collecting all of these terms, remember what this was, inertial velocity. This is, uh, we've got a negative and a negative. This is R theta dot ER. And then plus minus R theta dot ER plus L minus R theta, theta dot E theta. Well, these two cancel out, these first two, so zero. And so we're left with just L minus R theta, theta dot E theta. All right. Uh, now we could, um, what do we want to do now? We could do this again, get the in inertial acceleration, because that, that would go into F equals MA, Newton's law. So this is the inertial derivative of inertial velocity. And I'll just do the product rule. We've got the derivative of L minus R theta times theta dot E theta plus L minus R theta theta dot inertial derivative of E theta. What is this? It's the angular velocity cross E theta. This is theta dot E3 cross E theta. My diagram is now in the upper left. Okay, E3 cross E theta. My thumb's pointing in the negative ER direction. Negative ER. 
and then what is what does this become? This becomes negative r theta dot times theta dot plus l minus r theta theta double dot. Okay, let's just collect all these things. Plus r theta theta double dot e theta minus l minus r theta theta dot squared e r. Okay, right. So we've got the we've got the inertial acceleration written in a variable theta and its time derivatives. And also with respect to this polar coordinate frame, which is okay. We just need to also write the forces in terms of that frame. So now we can apply Newton's second law. And I like to write it as, you know, the mass times acceleration equals total force. So what, what is the total force? Um, let me do a little um, free body diagram. We've got the mass. Gravity isn't acting on this because we're talking about, think of the tether ball problem. That's just in the horizontal plane. You know, so maybe for the snake, we got to worry about gravity, but for this, we don't. So the only force is the force. Here's our, um, you know, point O prime. Here's our point P. We've got this tension force, and I'll just call it negative T, and it's in the ER direction. So good thing for us, the only force present can be written pretty easily in terms of this polar coordinate frame. Okay. So F equals MA uh, gives us negative R theta dot squared plus L minus R theta, theta double dot in the theta direction minus L minus R theta, theta dot squared ER. Uh, let's put a mass in front of everything. M equals negative T ER. Okay, so we have the two components, the E theta component and the ER component. So the ER component, it's the only one that has a force in that direction, but it doesn't have the highest derivative. Maybe we'll learn what the magnitude of the tension force is, but we're not gonna be able to solve for the dynamics. To solve for the dynamics, and let's just put that there's an implied, there's zero force in the E theta direction. But the E theta direction has the highest derivative, the second derivative, theta double dot. So we have, if you equate the different um, um, components, the E theta component is the one that has the dynamics we care about because of that higher derivative. So the E theta component is just negative. We can drop off the mass, the mass doesn't matter. Negative R theta dot squared plus L minus R theta, theta double dot equals zero. The force is zero in that direction, which we could also write, it's always a good idea to write it in the form of whatever your derivative is, the highest derivative equals something. So what do we get when we put things into that form? We get this. So this is a second order ODE for theta. It's nonlinear, so we'll have to use some other approach. But the fortunately, there's some hints on how to solve ODEs like this in the appendix of the book. So we can we'll rewrite this. It's theta double dot 
equals um, r over l minus r theta times theta dot, dot squared. In the appendix, appendix C gives some tools and techniques for how to solve nonlinear scalar ODEs like this. And this is in a particular form. If we think of some, just our general variable y, this is in the form y double dot equals f of y. It's a function of just the variable and then also a fun times a function of just the time derivative of that variable. This is equation c.6 in the book. So if we look over here, you know, say let theta be y, then in this case, we've got some function. This is of the form just a function of theta. And this is something that's just a function of theta dot. Then according to what it says in appendix six, we, we define a variable. We actually let, we refer to uh, theta dot as the variable. In this case, let's call it V. V is defined to be theta dot. Then this equation C point six can be written as V times V dot over G V equals F theta theta dot. In essence, we've done some um, separation of variables. Even we know there's a relationship between V and theta and it's through here, but we've been able to separate, you know, one side is just a function of V and its time derivatives and the other one is just a function of theta and its time derivatives. This is, I think this is equation C7 of the book, right? And what do we have? Um, GV, we've got V squared. All right, so you, you can integrate both sides. Integrate, we get from the initial V to V at the current time of, so after substituting in what GV is, this thing looks like, um, uh, dv over v. So v dot is dv by dt, theta dot is d theta by dt. The dt's cancel out. And then we've got that. And this is times um, or equals the initial angle to the current angle. Put in what we have for f. It's r divided by l minus r theta d theta. These are integrals that we can solve. Maybe it helps if we define some new variables to do the integrals. So here's a new variable, because we notice in this denominator on this right-hand side, it's L minus R theta. So that's good to use as a variable. Oh, whoa. Oh, I hope it didn't erase things. Oh no, it's all gone. It's kind of gone. Not, to, not, not so bad. Variables. Uh, L minus R theta. And so we take the differential of that and it's negative R D theta. And we are, we're gonna use T naught equals zero is the initial time. And then T is the current time. Okay, 
So this integral here becomes, uh, in terms of u, it's negative du over u. So it looks very much like the other side. And we can take that in integral. The integral of you know one over x is log x, natural log of x. So you go through that, go through some steps, and you get this. And then finally, what do we get? This relationship between V as a function of time and L. L. Just remind ourselves theta as a function of time, V naught. So we've got this now. This is Originally, we had what we would call either our kinetic or dynamic equation. This is now a kinematic ODE. How is it a kinematic ODE? Well, V over here, V equals D theta DT. So now we've got another ODE. It's an ODE that we can now solve for theta. You can integrate it, and I'll just give the answer. You can integrate the uh, kinematic ODE, and it gives theta equals L over R, one minus square root one minus two R over L, V naught times t, v naught's the initial theta dot, right, plus theta naught, where v naught is the initial angular rate. Say after the ball was hit, what's that initial angular rate? So this, you can analytically solve. Um, you could also solve it numerically if you, if you from this ODE up here, maybe you're like, okay, I don't know if I can solve that. Well, you could turn it into two first order ODEs and solve it in MATLAB or Mathematica. Um, but it turns out this is in a form that it could be solved analytically. Um, and just so you know, the same procedure here can work for the, the skydiver problem of homework one. Um, let me show you a simulation of what this would give for the, not for the skydiver, but for the, the tether ball. So I just made this in MATLAB right before the class. Um, it's kind of slow, kind of needs to be sped up, but it's got, it's got an, uh, frame rate, it's got equal time steps between the frames. So I think to make it more noticeable when it starts speeding up. Um, there is some trouble with producing animations as videos with MATLAB. So what I do is I just sort of have it play on the screen and then I do a screen record. So if you ever have to do something like that for a uh, presentation or your research, the easiest thing is just record the screen because yeah, MATLAB gives some trouble. Okay, it's speeding up and then, you know, eventually the ball will hit the pole and then that there's some different dynamics going on there. It's some impact situation. Um, maybe you could experimentally try this with the tether ball. It wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. Um, so the same, yeah, like I said, this could be the same procedure used for the the skydiver problem, you end up getting something where I think it's like the skydiver, we're measuring S going downward, right? And this becomes MG minus C S dot squared. That's our kind of air resistance and gravity. Uh, you could turn this into the 
form where it's g minus c s dot squared. Uh, and yeah, you can solve this. Um, you could write this right hand side in the form f s and g s dot and then you would eventually get that s as a function of time is v star squared over g times natural log of hyperbolic cosine g over v star t where uh, v star, this v star thing is the terminal velocity. And when I provide the solutions for the homework, I'll provide the MATLAB code. Um, that Because you could do MATLAB code of doing the just the computational situation and then compare with the analytical solution and they end up being the same. So, so that's nice. So this is showing S and S dot this from a numerical simulation using like OD45 and then the analytical. I don't overlay them, but they'll be exactly on top of each other. So I just move them into two different plots. So that's, uh, that's good. So this MATLAB code will be provided. It's part of the homework one solution. Okay. There are questions before I go on to the sort of some new stuff. Professor Ross, just to yeah. can you uh trying to wrap my head around this. Can you uh, explain what the direction of the velocity would be? Like, you know, the VT that we, the VFT that we calculated in the kinematic OD. So is that- for the, for, the, for the tether ball? Uh-huh. So the it would be going, we're saying that this thing is initially hit. So V naught is gonna be okay. theta naught dot. At the so we're, yeah, it's, it, well, it's the change, it's the angular velocity, right? So it's theta. If you actually want to know what's the, you know, what speed is P going at, it'll be at uh, L times V naught. Okay. Okay, perfect. But, yeah, we, I mean, we, once we translated it into a form where we can just deal with this angle theta, then, um, that's easier to work with. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right, can you go over again how you get the solvable OD form from theta dot? Theta double dot rather, yeah, like theta double dot equals R, L minus R theta, theta dot squared, and then it's like V times V dot, like can you go over how you get between those two equations again? Like how did that, how did that happen? So I, yes. I think it's in the appendix. I could try to duplicate it here. I would say theta double dot is the same as V dot. And then what do I have for G V? Um, uh, is that correct? V. Oh, and then I just multiply both sides. So this thing becomes, if you want, um, let me move things around. I've got V dot over G as a function of V is F theta. Now multiply both sides times V, but on one side we call it V, on the other side we keep it as theta dot. Okay, that uh, that's, that's where I was getting bungled up yeah All right, thanks so that's the trick and i i mean there it probably goes into more detail in the uh, appendix if you wanted to see that 
But then, yeah, once you have something in this form for any variable y, you could always do that transformation and make it um, do that separation of variables. Not all nonlinear ODEs will have it, so the right-hand side can be written this way, but some, some can. So in the last 20 minutes, I'll talk about something new. It's conservation of angular momentum and central force problems. So we talked about angular momentum last time, well, last week. And uh, we'll say what a central force problem is. So let me give a little diagram of our setup here. We've got some inertial origin O for our inertial frame, point P. There's some mass there. Here's the location of P with respect to our inertial origin. And there is a, in general, there's some force. It's pointing in some general direction. So this is just, um, from last week, we said the angular momentum P is HPO you know, with respect to the inertial frame. And what was that? That was the position across the inertial velocity. But then once we have the angular momentum vector, we can look at the dynamics of the angular momentum vector especially if motion is mostly going to be rotational. And that gives us this, I think we called it either Euler's equation or the rotational dynamics equation. Time rate of change of the angular momentum of P about the point O equals the moment or torque, but we'll stick with the terminology of moment on P about the point O where moment, the moment vector, is the vector of P with respect to O cross the total force on P. And the simplest case where we get conservation of angular momentum would be if, um, if the moment equals zero, so if the moment MPO equals the zero vector, so that means moment is zero, then the uh, angular momentum equals a constant vector. Uh, throughout the motion. So motion can still be happening. Another way to write this would be the angular momentum at some time t is the same as the angular momentum at uh, the initial time. And this is called conservation of angular momentum. And now, uh, what, what are the ways that this could occur? Well, if the total for, if f of p is zero, then the moment will be zero. So if either of these vectors in here is zero, then the moment will be zero. Uh, the other way that it could happen is if the force just happens to be parallel to R. So if the F vector is parallel to the R vector, 
And so that's the kind of interesting case. So one way that this occurs is that f of oops f of p the force is parallel to r p and if this is the case this parallelness this is called a central force Um, typically, because it means that f of p is pointed, the, the general case will be, well, not general, most commonly, f of p will be directed, uh, it's not parallel in the same direction, it's anti-parallel. So f of p is pointing towards the origin. So the origin might be, you know, some gravitational center, like the center of the Earth, and p is a satellite. So f of p for the satellite is pointing towards the middle of the Earth. So that's a central force problem. But there are other cases too that maybe aren't obvious. Um, but let me just sketch. Here's you know, P, here's R P. So being parallel means either it's going, the force is going that way or it's going this way. F of P, you could write it this way, parallel, it's the parallel symbol, R. So we'll look at an example. This is example uh, 3.12 of the book, and then I think it's revisited 4.8. And uh, we'll insert figure it's this okay so this is just from the book uh, we've got the coordinates over here so what's the situation well, this is a point p which is a mass attached by a spring linear spring to the origin the, think of the, the attachment of the spring over here at O uh, can freely pivot around. So if we pulled on this P, you know, away from equilibrium and kind of also gave it a shove sideways, this thing will kind of be oscillating around and going in a circle around its attachment point. And so we want to solve for that motion. And um, so the coordinates are described here in this first frame. We've got A and R. It makes sense. We expect you know, polar coordinates will be the most useful here, not Cartesian, so polar coordinates. Uh, we've got our reference frames. So E1, E2 defines the inertial frame. And then ER, E theta is the B frame, or it's the polar coordinate frame. Um, and then the free body diagram, there's only one force acting and it is a, a spring force. So we've got K is our spring constant. Uh, R naught is a uh, equilibrium length. So this says that the force due to the spring is it's linear and it's proportional to the stretch in the spring from equilibrium. So if you compact the spring down, it'll push it out. If you pull on it, it'll bring it back. It's a linear restoring force. Okay, this is our F of P. And you'll notice that we have here the case that uh, F of P is parallel to R. Hopefully, if I were to draw R, say here, right, this is R, P, O. Um, so F of P is parallel to R. So we've got a central force problem. Um, how would we approach this? We, so we've said up above, there's some relationship with conservation of angular momentum, but let's say we didn't know that. 
and we'll just solve it the way we would usually solve a problem, which means uh, write Newton's laws or Newton's uh, second law. That's the F equals MA. M A so acceleration vector equals the total force, which in this case is just negative K R minus R naught E R. Okay. Um, that's what we would do. And then we would try to solve it. We would write down the ER and E theta components. So let's just do that over here where we've got a little bit more room. All right, so the ER components and the E theta components of this Newton's second law as a vector equation. Um, I'm gonna assume we've already, a few times we've written the acceleration in terms of the polar coordinate frame. So I'm not gonna redo all of that. Let's just say we know it and just write down what we got. So we got R double dot plus K over M R minus R not minus R theta dot squared. Our goal is not to give names like this is Coriolis, this is centrifugal, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's more just to write down ODEs that can be solved to predict motion, okay? So that's what we get for ER in the E theta direction. Uh, we got this. So those are our two, looks like we've got some coupled, two coupled second order ODEs. And they're nonlinear. Thanks to, you know, this term up here is nonlinear. This is nonlinear. So in general, we would like give up and say, yeah, I can't do this. But, uh, well, you could simulate this, right? You could turn this into a first order form, put it in MATLAB and go your way that way. Um, but this is a central force problem. So we know that angular momentum is conserved. So maybe we could use that to our advantage. So the angular momentum of point P about O is conserved. Uh, and what is it? It is R cross uh, MV. Oh, I think I forgot the M up here. Did I? Yeah, there should be an M right there. It's not just R cross V, it's R cross M V. It's the R cross the uh, linear momentum. So that's M times V. And writing this in terms of polar coordinates, we get M R squared theta dot the E3 direction. So even though the motion is happening in the E1, E2 plane, the angular velocity, I'll put the E3 direction, is coming out of the screen at you. The angular momentum vector is pointing out of the screen. Um, so if this is conserved, that means that we can just consider the E3 component. So I'll just call this thing H, okay? So this is H, E3, H is a scalar. That's easier to deal with. Um, and H at the initial time is H, um, or H at any time is H at the initial time. In fact, let's just call that H naught. So this is M R squared at some time times theta dot at some time equals uh, M R squared at the initial time theta dot at the initial time. And we can rewrite this, remembering that theta dot is d theta dt. So we got d theta dt equals, the masses cancel, and we've got some formula So that's interesting. Over here we have a, this second equation is a second order 
ODE for theta. But over here, because of conservation of angular momentum, we just have a first order ODE for theta. Which if we knew the initial conditions for R and theta dot, and also how R is changing with time, we could reconstruct how theta is changing with time. Okay. Um, you could write it this way, or if we write things in terms of H naught, uh, we get, I want to write this. Yep. Using uh, using H naught because I think that's what's used in the book. H naught you get from the initial conditions, right? H naught is m r squared zero theta dot zero. So we have r theta dot squared equals H naught squared m squared r to the third. Um, why am I writing that? Because this thing shows up, let me do it in orange, in this first ODE up here on the upper left. Okay. So, um, This second order ODE for theta can be simplified to the following R double dot plus K over M R minus R naught minus. And why are we doing this? If we, when we write it this way, we've got it looks like the motion in R is uncoupled from the motion in theta, because now it can be simplified to this. And this is uncoupled to the theta motion. If I wanted the theta motion, I could solve this first order ODE for theta once I know R is a function of time. So to get R as a function of time, I would solve this second order ODE. And it's, it's a big deal to have things that are uncoupled um, because they're easier to solve. So we can solve this ODE for R uh, given initial conditions. R zero and R dot zero which would be related to, you know, where am I holding the mass with respect to its rest length? Um, and am I, you know, pulling it out or pushing it back? So you could solve that, uh, let's say numerically. You could turn this into something you put into MATLAB. And then this would give you R as a function of time. And uh, let me call this equation up here, uh, pound sign. And so once you're given R as a function of time, you can make the technical term in the literature is you could reconstruct theta as a function of time from that uh, pound equation. So the power in having a central force problem is that we started with a two degree of freedom system. So the problem of solving for the motion of a two degree of freedom system, in this case it's planar, uh was oh yeah what are the what were the two degrees of freedom 
in R and theta. Uh, this was effectively reduced to a one degree of freedom system. Or I'll just abbreviate it as DOF. And why did this happen? Because we used the angular momentum, more generally, we used what's called a constant of motion. And we'll talk about other constants of motion later in this course. You know, in this case, uh, angular momentum. Sometimes these constants of motion will have names, sometimes they won't. Uh, but other constants of motion that can be used to help solve a problem or at least simplify it. Um, let me give a few of the common ones. Total energy or sometimes I'll just write energy, uh, linear momentum. And then there are others with no names that will just sort of show up in problems once we get to the Lagrangian formulation. 